working through no fault of our own. The first half of this study, we looked at individuals that Jesus interacted with and they made poor choices, um, went down difficult paths in their own lives and we saw how no situation was too difficult, too great, too far gone for the Savior's love and that brings all of us comfort. But what about those times when you are faced with seemingly trial after trial, you receive a scary diagnosis, somebody hurts you, um, lets you down, betrays you, or you faced with um, challenges in your youth that just seem to follow you all the way through adulthood, whatever it might be. Sometimes we experience those kinds of brokenness and or have loved ones that experience them. And thankfully, we have beautiful encounters there too. We're gonna look at just one of them together during this session. And on your handout, um, it's two-sided. So one side has the text that we're gonna look at together. I just printed that off for you for your convenience so that we could all, um, I'm gonna ask you some questions and hopefully we can discover some things together and I thought it'd be easier if we were all on the same page, same, um, what am I trying to say? Version, thank you. <laughs> um, and then the other side is some columns for you that we're gonna go through and fill out together as we make application for ourselves and for the people that we love. So we're going to be starting at Mark chapter 5, and I again would like for you to put yourself as much as you can into this account. So try to envision the scene as it unfolds in your mind's eye. Try to fill in as many details as you can. What it felt like, what it would have sounded like, um, were you hot, were you feeling a little claustrophobic, you might even feel that a little bit as this account unfolds. Try to put yourself in this woman's shoes as much as you can. And the first thing I would like for us to do together, you have a couple of choices. I'm going to be listing out some things on the board as we look at them together. You can either write them on your list or maybe, since it's just listed out for you in your um, text that's printed out, you can number them. So as we go through and notice some things, you might just underline it or number it in your text or fill out your lists. The first thing we notice is that there is a huge crowd following Jesus. Why do you think there was a huge crowd following Jesus? He was healing people and word had spread. Um, earlier in Mark, we read that it was almost impossible for him to travel anywhere because the crowds kept following him. You might think in your mind of certain occasions when he had to go out onto a boat on the water just to be able to address the size of the crowd that was there to hear him or witness miracles. So word of Jesus had spread and people knew he was the great teacher by this point. They knew definitely that he was performing miracles and wonders and signs. So this is one of those occasions where a huge crowd, um, not in your text, but earlier in the chapter in verse 21, it says that a large crowd gathered around him and he stayed by the seashore. Um, where you are picks up at verse 25, and we have the broken woman. A woman, what's her name? We don't know. But there are, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things that we learn about this woman just from verses 25 and 26. And so, what is the very first thing that we learn about this woman? She had a... Um, I don't know how to spell that. In some of your older versions, do you remember reading? I don't know if it was the King James, I don't know if the New King James says it, but some of the older versions read, had an issue of blood. And so I've titled your columns on the back side of yours as a woman with an issue. And I like that because we all have issues. Yeah. It may not be an issue of blood, but we all have issues. So. The first thing we see about her is she had an issue, particularly a hemorrhage, um, a problem with bleeding. And how long had she had it? 12 years. And what does it say next in verse 26? She had endured much. All right, we'll note some of these things in just a minute. Right now we're going to list them out. Next, at the hands of... She had been to many physicians and had next, in verse 26, what do we see? 
spent all. All right. And was, what's the next thing? Not helped. In fact, it says at all. Not helped at all, but what's the last thing we see? Grown worse. All right, so we don't know her name, but we're starting to get a little bit of insight into her life, and I want us to try to um, put ourselves in her shoes as we see some of these things. In order for us to really grasp what this meant for a woman in the first century, we need to go back and look at the old law. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn over to um, Leviticus chapter 15. Leviticus chapter 15, verse 19. Now, Leviticus is when you read all of those regulations for health, um, well-being that God gave his people so that they would know how to take care of themselves and the community. In Leviticus chapter 15, starting at verse 19, we read where this woman um, needed to understand how she was to proceed with this hemorrhage or this issue of blood. When a woman has a discharge, if her discharge in her body is blood, she shall continue in her menstrual impurity for seven days, and whoever touches her shall be unclean until evening. So what's this particular verse talking about when she has her period, her monthly period? Look what it says when a woman is on her period. Everything also on which she lies during her menstrual impurity shall be what? Unclean, okay? And then everything on which she sits shall be unclean. Verse 21, anyone who touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be what? Unclean until evening. Whoever touches anything on which she sits shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Whether it's on the bed or the thing on which she is sitting when he touches it, he shall be unclean until evening. If a man actually lies with her so that her menstrual impurity is on him, he shall be unclean seven days and every bed on which he lies shall be unclean. Are you starting to get a picture of just what it was like just to have your monthly cycle? Um, now look at verse 25. If a woman has a discharge of her blood many days, not at the period of her menstrual impurity. So now we're talking about what she's going through. She has a hemorrhage, an issue of blood, or if she has a discharge beyond that period, all the days of her impure discharge, she shall continue as though in her menstrual impurity, she is what? Unclean. So on the back, you have another column that says that she suffered. And we're going to start listing some ways that she suffered. The first thing we see is that she would have been considered unclean. Verse 27, it goes on. Whoever touches them shall be unclean. Um, and they have to wash their clothes. They have to bathe. They're unclean. When she becomes clean from her discharge, she shall count off for herself seven days. And then afterward, she shall be clean. And then she can take herself and her offerings and bring them to the tent of meeting and make an offering. So let's think about this for just a second and what it would have meant for this woman to be considered unclean for how long? 12 years. So the fact that she's considered unclean, what do we now know that that's going to affect in her life personally? Just think about it. Self-esteem because, um, do you remember what they had to do when they had leprosy? Everybody that touched that person would have been considered unclean so that they had to announce Right? They had to cover their face. They had to announce themselves when they went out so that people would know to give them space. Well, she's in a very similar situation because everybody who comes into contact with her is now unclean, including anything that she has sat on or laid on. Lied on, laid on. So she's got to have a wide berth, and if it's been 12 years, do you think people in her community know about her situation? Sure, because they don't want to have to go through the purification process of seven days before they themselves are considered clean. So 
There's the, the self-esteem factor. How else is it going to affect her? What? She's lonely. Why is she lonely? Nobody can touch her. The text doesn't say anything about whether or not she has a husband. But if she does, 12 years. Now, we've had COVID for how long now? Like seven months. I am weary to death of social distancing and isolation, and I miss hugs. I want to hug all you people. Can you imagine? I mean, I hug my family. Can you imagine 12 years of no intimacy, no relationship, no hugging, no physical contact, because everybody who touches her. So we can add, um, all right, let's put self-esteem, that's a dash. Isolation, because she was lonely. So what kind of sufferings are these so far that we've talked about? They're emotional, right? Would you say they're emotional? What other types of sufferings are there besides emotional suffering? Physical. Do you think she suffered physically? Of course. Physical. Now, not to get too personal here, but it's not that fun just being on your normal cycle. And sometimes you might have trouble with, well, we don't have to go into that. Sometimes it's not fun. Um, and the lightheadedness or everything that goes along with it, 12 years. So of, of the issue of blood, so the weakness, um, the low iron, she was probably very pale. Um, so all of that stuff going into just the physical aspect of it. How else did she suffer? Spiritually, why would it be a spiritual suffering? Yeah, she couldn't go to the temple. She's considered unclean. If you've ever had a point in your life when you've had to stay, well, I mean, we all have. But, you know, you miss that. You miss going and learning and, and sitting at the feet of the teachers and growing and fellowshipping together. She's not even able to do that spiritually because she's unclean. There's at least one more way that she suffered. Can you think of one we've got? I mean, we could put socially because of some of the things we've talked about up here with the isolation and, you know, people having to give her a wide berth. But how else did she suffer? Financially, exactly. So we know that she went to many physicians. And the Bible says that she spent all, look at these comprehensive words here. She spent all that she had. And it didn't do her a lick of good. Now, it's hard enough being a woman in the first century, but being a woman with no money is really at the mercy of others. And she was not helped at all. There's that comprehensive word again. But had grown worse. I can't even imagine what these guys the ones who are supposed to know what they're doing, put her through. What did they, well, let's try this. Well, maybe if we tried this. Well, what about this? And she goes to one right after the other. Nothing helps. She's even worse, and now she's broke on top of it all. When um, you look at words like endured here in the text, let's see where it's mentioned. Oh, I'm still in Leviticus. It's not mentioned. Mark chapter 5. Okay, verse 26. She had endured much. Um, that word translates in the original language literally as suffered. And it's the same word that Mark is going to use later in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, where the son of man must suffer many things. So it's a strong word. Everything that she went through. And now, we don't know her name, but just understanding what it would have meant for her to have this hemorrhage for 12 years, just understanding what that means under, under the law, for her being unclean, now we understand more of this. And now, maybe, it's easier for us to empathize with her or sympathize with her and put ourselves in her shoes. 
So that's the broken woman that we're looking at right now. How many of these things are her own fault? None of them. She did not ask for any of this. But all of this is what she has had to deal with in her life. Verse 27, though, here's the Savior's love. After hearing about Jesus, she probably heard that he was the great physician. She's going to... She's going to go to the great... These guys couldn't do anything, but now she's going to go to the great position. She came up in the crowd behind him. Verse 21 in your text that you don't have there says the large crowd gathered. Verse 24, a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. So this is the part where I really want you to try and envision yourself at this scene. It's not that he's walking along and a crowd of people are following him. They are pressing in on him while he is walking along. And so she comes up behind him in the crowd and touches his cloak. Why did she come up behind him? <laughs> was she supposed to be there? No. She was not even supposed to be in that crowd. So she comes up, verse 27, behind him, touches his cloak, here we have insight into her heart. Verse 27. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, what does it say? I might get well? I will. What has she heard about the great physician? If I just touch his garments, I will get well. So what insight do we already have into her heart? Faith. She believes. She heard and she believed. And this is really cool here because this word well in verse 28, I will get well, in the original language, it's the same word as saved. I will get saved. It's the exact same word that Mark is going to use in a verse you're familiar with, Mark 16, 16. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. The exact same word here is the one that she's using. I will get well. What is... Your first word in verse 29. Immediately. Immediately. You may have heard that the gospel of Mark is the gospel of action. And when things happen with Jesus, they happen immediately. The flow of her blood was dried up. This is another interesting study because that word flow is a spring. A spring or a fountain is what that word means. So think about different bodies of water. What's the difference between a spring and, say, um, a lake? A spring is flowing, right? That's the source. The water is constantly, com that's the source of the water, and it's coming out right there. Maybe you visited somewhere where you saw the spring and you saw the water bubbling out. So that's the kind of flow that she endured. It was it was constantly on the move. It was constantly flowing. It was a fountain of blood. Immediately it was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. So we have some more interesting things that we want to talk about. But before we get there, we already have some insight into Jesus. So if she just touches the hem of his garment, and immediately she's healed, what word could we use to describe Jesus? Powerful. That's all we need to know right now. He is powerful because immediately the blood was dried up. She felt in her body. So that is four words in our English translations. But um, in the original language, it's only one word. And it's the word um, no, K-N-O-W, or past tense here as it's used in the sentence. And the cool thing is that um, the Greek language had two different words for no, oida and gnosko. And oida, and I don't know Greek, I just know these two words. Oida is just general knowledge. So you can read about something and you have a general knowledge of that thing. So um, men can oida childbirth. They can read about it. They can have a general knowledge. The second type is gnosko. That's experiential knowledge. Men can never gnosko childbirth. 
parenting. You can read up all you want to about parenting, but you have no idea what it's really like until you're parenting. There's a difference. So we understand that. Well, here, guess which kind of knowledge this is? Experiential. The text says she, Gnosko, that she was healed. She knew, she experienced it, she felt it, that she was healed of her affliction. And the word healed there means restored. So can you imagine, after getting to this point right here, she had spent all she had, she had grown worse, to in one immediate moment, she's restored. It's not just that her blood was stopped, and so she could, at that point in her life, gradually start regaining her strength back. If you've ever had a problem with your iron being depleted, you know it takes a while to build that back up, doesn't it? It takes a while for it to get back to where it needs to be in your body. Well, she was immediately restored to good health, to maybe where she was, I don't, what was her health 12 years ago, but she was restored in that moment. So I kind of envision her in my mind, pressing through that, you know, trying to squeeze her way through that crowd, pressing in on Jesus, and she can just barely, first of all, she's not supposed to be there. She can just barely make her way through because she's weak, and she's tired, and she's weary, and she's got her head down, and she reaches out, and she touches his garment, and she can immediately feel the difference. And what do you think she did? Can you imagine her just standing up and soaking in the moment? of what that, what that would have been like after 12 long years and all of these failed physicians. And immediately in this moment, she is restored of her affliction. The word affliction here, I told you that it uses some serious words to describe her suffering. This one is the same word that they use to describe scourgings that they would experience. You know, so when they're being whipped with those cords of dried bone and flint and everything else, that's the word that they use here, this affliction. And then look at verse 30. What's your first word in verse 30? Immediately, right? Or do you have something different on your face? Okay, Jesus perceiving in himself. So perceiving in himself is the exact same phrase as she felt in her body. So it's gnosko. He experientially knowledge, experiential knowledge. He, perceiving in himself that the power, we just noticed up here, that Jesus is powerful, he felt the power proceeding from him, had gone forth, he turned around in the crowd, and what does he say? Who did that? Did Jesus know who did that? He did, but... You can't really blame his disciples for their reaction, even though they knew who they were following, and they knew he had the power and he's the great physician. They still reacted very humanly. What did they say? Huh? You see all these people pressing in on you, and you're going to say, who touched me? And if we had the time, I think it'd be kind of cool to get all of us up here. I mean, we're COVID anyway, but to get all of us up here, and one of you pretend to be Jesus, and one of you pretend to be the woman with the issue, and come up behind him, and then the one pretending to be Jesus has to guess who it was. I mean, even in this small crowd, we know that's ridiculous. And the disciples think, you see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman. Maybe if you're marking some things on the text, put a big old square around that word C. He looked around. First of all, he looked to see the woman who had done this. Okay, so we mentioned the fact that, you know, what would it have been like in that moment of, of, of weakness to feel the restoration, to stand up straight, to take it in, and in the very next second, Jesus says, who did that? So knowing what we know now, and the fact that she's not even supposed to be in that crowd, she's definitely not supposed to be touching the great physician. How do you think she feels? 
scared. Yeah, the, the text tells us, in fact, uh, verse 33, but the woman fearing and trembling. So she's restored, but now she's fearful and she's trembling. Aware of what had happened to her, here's some more insight into her heart. And verse 33, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Okay, so a couple of things that we see. She came and fell down before him. What does that say about her character? She is also, what? Humble. She came down. She's acknowledging his greatness, and she's kneeling down. And then she told him the whole truth. What does that tell her about her character? She's honest. She's not trying to make excuses. She's just telling him the whole truth. Now, I don't know about you, but really, looking at my own coward self and understanding that I was just completely restored to good health, I mean, would I have just run away and, or maybe ducked really low and tried to, you know, sneak my way through the crowd because I don't want to own up to the fact that I was somewhere I wasn't supposed to be and touching somebody when I know I'm unclean and that I'm going to make everybody around me that I've just touched unclean. But she comes and falls down before him, tells him the whole truth, so giving us insight into her heart. And look what he says to her in verse 34. What's the, what does he call her in verse 34? Daughter. Can you imagine for a woman that's gone through all of this isolation, how that would have felt? a family term, a relationship term, and he's acknowledging her, he's calling her daughter. Your faith has made you well. We already mentioned earlier that we know when she heard about Jesus, she believed and she had faith. Here he's saying, your faith has made you well. Well, wait a second. I thought it was the power of Jesus that made her well because he felt the power go out of him. So which one is it? It's both. It's both. She heard about Jesus and she believed what she heard, but what did she have to do? She still had to go to Jesus. She still had to act on that faith, right? And then when she came into contact with Jesus, just like we do when we contact his blood in the waters of baptism, then she was saved. Then his power saved her. Just hearing about it and believing it wasn't enough. So it was both. Her faith, his power, your faith has made you well. That's the same word that she used earlier. If I just touch his garments, I'll be made well. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And this is that same word that we looked at earlier. Freedom from worry and anxiety. Go in peace. Be healed of your affliction. That's the same word we saw up in verse 29 that that big word that they used for scourging. Okay, so here's what we want to notice. We've already seen that Jesus is powerful because as soon as she touched him, she was made well. But what else do we have? What other insight do we have into the Savior's love from this particular account? What kind of words would you use to describe him here? Compassionate. Did somebody say that? thought I heard that. Perfect. Why do we know he was compassionate? What could he have said to her? I can't believe you did that. I know your story. I know you're unclean. I know who you are. I know where you've been. I know what you've done. All those other things. He could have called her out right there in front of everybody in the crowd. Would he have been justified in doing that? Yes. But he didn't. He did not do that to her. He was compassionate. What else would we say about Jesus? Gracious. Gracious. Why would you say that? And probably more than she expected. She knows that if she goes to Jesus, he can heal her. But really, in her mind's eye, after all of this, 
Do you think she was seriously expecting it to be immediate and complete restoration? Don't you think that had to have been more than she could have imagined and more than she hoped for? But that's what she got when she went to Jesus. Ah, go ahead. No, fine. Exactly, and I'm glad you brought that up. Why do you think he called her out? We already know he wasn't trying to shame her because he was being compassionate and gracious. But why do you think he made a point to call her out and say, who touched me? Yes, it was for her sake. Because remember what we said? After she's gone through that for so long, she would have experienced all that isolation because everybody knew she was unclean. Well, now, what does everybody know? She's clean. She's good to go. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. He said that to her for her sake. He called her out for her sake and everybody else's benefit. So he was gracious in that way. Do you remember that word I said? If you, if you want to mark in your text, maybe draw a big square around this word. What word was that? C. So what does that tell us about Jesus? What? He's all-knowing. Even in the crowd. Have you ever felt lost in the crowd? Just, just one of a bunch of other people and insignificance. But even in the midst of the crowd and everybody pressing in on Jesus, he saw her the individual. And along with that, could we add the word available? Now, if we had taken the time to go back earlier in the text, before, or I don't think you have it on your paper, where does yours start at? 25? Okay, so in verse 21, where it says Jesus crossed it in the boat, a large crowd gathered around him. Verse 22 says, one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and seeing him fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come lay your hands on her so she'll get well and live. And he went off with him and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. And here's the scene where our woman who's broken comes up to him. So Jesus was actually in the middle of something an important something. And yet, he stopped and made time for her. He's available. And not only that, but did you catch how here we have the synagogue official who came up to Jesus on behalf of his daughter. Why didn't anybody come up to Jesus on behalf of this woman? That blows my mind. If she's been suffering for 12 years and everybody knows it, how come nobody went to Jesus on her behalf? Why did she have to fight her way through the crowd in her weakened state and in her unclean state? I mean, if we were ever going to have a clearer picture of what it means to be truly alone in this world, that's where she was. But he saw her. He was available. He was compassionate. All of these things. And so... That leaves this last category. What words would you use to describe her being saved? How was she saved? What happened? What kind of words would you use here? One of them is a word that we see twice in the text. Immediately. All right. What else? I heard somebody starting to say something on this side. How's <coughs> complete? Yes. <coughs> Completely. So there was nothing stingy about it. She didn't have any special hoops that she had to go through. He didn't call her out and say, well, okay, but first I want you to blah, 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 and you really need to acknowledge that you shouldn't even be, he didn't do anything like that. He immediately 
completely saved her. You could pet freely. All of those things. All of those good words. She got more than she thought was ever possible when she came to see Jesus broken in her situation. Okay, so here's what I want us to do as we connect the dots. The second half of your paper that has the columns on it, this is where I want us to make it as personal as possible. I've asked you as we walk through this text, try and put yourself in her shoes. Try to envision the crowd and your, your broken, weakened state. Try to, try to understand as much as you can. Even this woman that we never met and we don't know, but do you kind of feel like you know her a little bit better? after understanding what this would have been like for her. Well, we all have a story. We all have issues. On the second half of your paper, you also have a woman suffered, Jesus saved, or however I worded it. I can't remember. But this time the woman is you. So this is your name right here. And maybe you can come up with seven things that describe your life um, maybe things that you've experienced or things that have happened to you, things that you've overcome, whatever it might be, we all have things because we're in this life and not the next. So whatever that is, that's your story. That's what somebody might read about you in a couple of verses in a paragraph. And maybe there are some things on here that nobody even knows but you and God. And then because of these things that you've experienced or that have happened to you, how have you suffered because of that? Maybe you've suffered physically. We know a lot of dear ones have. Emotionally, um, socially, spiritually, financially. Maybe in some of these ways you can really empathize because you've been there or you are there yourself. And sometimes we don't even mean to suffer spiritually. She did because she was unclean and couldn't go to the temple. But sometimes, whatever we suffer, we suffer spiritually anyway because we start asking some questions, like Job. And we don't understand. And we don't realize why this is happening, or how long is it going to, or when will, when will I ever see the light at the end of the tunnel? When will this be resolved? When will my loved ones come back home? Whatever it might be. Sometimes we wrestle here, spiritually. But here's the thing, even with all of this, what can you put about Jesus and your Savior's heart? Could you write on that list that he's powerful? I think so. Or compassionate or gracious? All, is he still all-knowing? Is he still available? All of these things that we read about in the text with this broken woman are still true for us today. God is God, and he still sees. He's still available, even in this whole world of people. He still sees. He still calls us daughter. And how does he say? It could be that whatever you're suffering with or your loved ones are suffering with will not be immediately restored in this life. But, you know, one day, it will be. And if it's a spiritual problem, you know it's immediate as soon as you contact the blood of Jesus. Right? So, freely, completely, graciously, mercifully, when we come broken through no fault of our own, this is the Savior's heart, and this is everything that he has to offer for us today. And again... I don't know if you're watching the news right now. I'm trying really hard not to. But what do you see? Huh? Fighting, hate, fear, divisiveness, manipulation. I mean, pretty much every bad word is kind of being displayed right now in our culture. More than anything else, this is what the people around us need to see. And we are the ones that get to show them that. No matter what we're going through, we're the ones to get the point people to the Savior's heart. Will you pray with me, please? 
Our Father in heaven, again, we're so grateful to you that we can come to your word and get a glimpse into your love and your character because we know when we read about these events, we learn about you. And Father, help us to remember that as we walk through each day, sometimes not knowing what lies ahead, just being so mindful of the past and everything we've already either endured or experienced. Father, help us to keep our eyes on you through it all. And we know that the future is bright, even though things around us seem to be dim. Help us to shine that bright light so others will see it and they'll be drawn to it. Help us to um, show others the joy of what it means to be in Christ, the joy of experiencing Christian fellowship and love, and making the most of your mercy and compassion to the point that others want to know what's different so that we can show them your way and your son. Father, we're so grateful for each woman here today. We know that everyone has a story, which means every woman in this room has dealt with something or faced something or loves somebody who has. And Father, we pray that you'll be with each woman and her influence. Help her to show your love, to be strong um, in your grace and your strength. And Father, until we all spend eternity with you in heaven, help us to continue to encourage each other and lift each other up through your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.